Hi everyone. My name is Allison Sprana. Uh, I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. I have been chronically ill for almost eight years um, and my chronic illnesses started with the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, I have diagnoses like ME-CFS, that's myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, dysautonomia, hypermobility, chronic pain, endometriosis, and others. Um, I've also, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been involved with a lot of advocacy for long COVID as someone with chronic illnesses that were caused by a virus myself. I am here today with Colorado Cross Disability Coalition reaching out to you, our chronic illness community here in Colorado, because I've realized that many of us are not aware of long-term services and supports that are available to us through Medicaid. I've been sick for almost eight years now, and I just recently got access to these services myself because I had thought previously people like me with invisible fluctuating chronic illnesses wouldn't qualify for these services. Now that I am actually receiving them, my quality of life has improved drastically. Um, before this, I was I really struggled to keep up with daily necessities because my symptoms and medical conditions made it basically impossible to contribute to household chores. I struggled for many years. Um, seven years ago at the beginning of my illness, I regularly left our gas stove top on um, due to brain fog, which is really dangerous. And so I decided at that point that it was no longer safe for me to cook, but I had no idea how to get my needs met. Otherwise, I didn't know that long term services through Medicaid was an option. And I just survived on, you know, pre prepared grocery store meals, snacks and, and um, protein shakes. Um, now, fast forward quite a few years, I'm on the disability uh, Medicaid disability buy-in program for working adults with disabilities. And so that means I pay $25 a month to get access to full Medicaid benefits, which includes long-term services. Um, with long-term services now, I get 20 to 30 hours per week of help from Medicaid, all paid by Medicaid, to give me help at home and in our community. Um, I get help with the things that I can't do because of chronic illness that are necessary daily things, laundry, cleaning, grocery shopping, prescription pickup, bathing, doing my hair, transportation, help with PT, help making the bed, and other things that I'll talk about later in the presentation. The most important thing that I want you to know today is that if you are here today with us and you're feeling a little nervous or intimidated by the fact that this program requires you to be on Medicaid or that there's a lot of terminology that you're not familiar with, that's okay. I want you to be here with us today. You are welcome here. Having an invisible chronic condition, especially one that fluctuates and is unpredictable, can make it hard to navigate the systems of benefits and services, but you deserve to have your needs met and to have the best quality of life that you can have. So I hope you can learn today um, from our presentation a little bit more about how to navigate these things so that you can advocate for yourself and our, our chronic illness community so we can get the services that we need. Really start at take seven. Um, so it definitely does take time to, to learn this. And that's why organizations like CCDC are here is to break stuff down, um, to make things more understandable. And I always consider myself bilingual. I don't speak another language, but I speak Medicaid and it feels like another language. So we, the, that's part of what our job is, is to break things down and to help people get over barriers. So the reason we're doing these presentations um, and that we actually sought funding from a foundation called the Next 50 uh, Initiative is because we have a system right now to provide long-term services and supports. And that system, there's a lot of things about it that are good. There's some things about it that are not so good, but regardless, there's some major changes coming. So we took that this as an opportunity to educate people about the changes, but our focus, like the groups that we want to reach the most are actually people like you, because it's we've identified certain populations of people that have not had equitable access to these services um, ever, really. And so, the, the, and that's a very wide variety of people. So for example, um, monolingual Spanish speakers living in resort, rural resort communities is another group, but people with hidden disabilities or 
disabilities that aren't on like a typical list is definitely a group that has been, um, you know, not that anyone has come out and written on a piece of paper, you can't have this, but they've not been getting it in an equitable level. So that's why we're, that's why, that's why I reached out to Allison because I know she's part of this community and said, will you help us? Uh, because because we want to make sure that everyone knows a that these are out here and b that every community has people that are trained to help navigate peers through the system. So um, so CCDC the color so I always say people say well what does Colorado Cross Disability Coalition mean? Well. Um, Cross disability means that we believe people with different types of disabilities have more in common than not, and that we do better fighting together. So whether whether you have a chronic illness or you're blind or you have a learning disability or a mental illness or you use a wheelchair, our issues really are the same. It's access to supports and healthcare. It's housing that we can afford and that's safe and works for our disability. It's transportation for a lot of us. It's employment that provides accommodations. So our issues are the same, even though specific pieces of our issues might be different. Um, we advocate for social justice for all Coloradans with seen and unseen disabilities of all age, ages. And we have, we've spent a ton of time on Medicaid. Membership, we are a membership organization. And the more members we have, the more power we have when we're fighting for these systems. Our membership is free, and I would invite everyone to, to join, and then you'll get access to information about us. We, you can also check us out on Facebook or Twitter. Um, so I want to spend a little time just kind of level setting on what Medicaid is. And, I, and, and again, I just talked about how complicated it is. This is a very, very basic overview. So I could... I could talk about what Medicaid is for a month, um, but I'm not going to, don't worry. So Medicaid, Medicaid eligibility covers lots of different people for lots of different reasons. But with, with, with one major exception, it's mostly for people who are low income. Every state has a different Medicaid program. So like you might've been in another state, like if you came here from Nebraska and you were a adult, um, without children who was low income, you probably were told that you weren't eligible and in Nebraska, you weren't. Um, but in Colorado, you would be because Colorado has different rules. Um, so, but it's usually people who are low income, but the one big exception is people with disabilities who work are allowed to have a very high income and buy into our Medicaid. That's the program Allison talked about. That's the program I use personally. It's a path out of poverty for people with disabilities. And the really cool thing is it, you, any work counts as long as you're paid. So it, it doesn't have to be that you have to be able to work 40 hours or even 20 or 10. We have people on this program um, who work just one or two hours a week because that's what they can do with their disability. And then we have people who work two jobs um, and everything in between. So, um, and, and if people are really interested, we, we're actually, I think at our, um, at another meeting, we'll do um, a different meeting. We're gonna be doing a presentation just on the buy-in program, Allison. I just wanna make a note that also for the Medicaid buy-in for working adults with disabilities, the definition of disability, you do not have to be on social security disability to qualify for this program. Correct. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Um, if you are, you get to save a step in the application process, but you don't have to. And we have people at our office who actually help people through this process. When we talk about long, and I'm going to talk about long-term services and supports, but when we talk about that, th those are things that help you kind of every day. And that's, um, and again, I'll get more into that in a minute. Um, and so, but that's also called HCBS, Home and Community-Based Services. and Home and community-based services provide a lot of different things. So when we talk about, well, what's Medicaid versus LTSS? So regular Medicaid, what they sometimes call state plan Medicaid, original Medicaid, just Medicaid, is like expand, it's kind of like health insurance, but better. It's it's what covers medical care. So like a doctor, a hospital, prescription drugs, um, x-rays, blood tests. Um, 
oxygen if you need it, all of the things that like you think of when you think of medical stuff. In addition, uh, it also covers mental health, um, although some of us would say not very well, but it does. And all, it also covers transportation. Now that's not typical of insurance, but because Medicaid's focused on poor people, um, the, the federal law says that Medicaid has to cover transportation because if you're dealing with a poverty population or a population of people with disabilities, many of whom can't drive, and then you say, well, yeah, we'll, we'll pay for you to go to the doctor, but you can't get to the doctor. It's kind of, you know, the courts have said, well, that's kind of a meaningless benefit. So it does cover transportation and it covers a limited dental benefit. It's $1,500 a year which is some people, especially those who have gone for years without dental care need more, but for many years, we didn't have anything. Um, the only thing it really doesn't cover are glasses and hearing aids, which is something that we're working on, but, it, but those are not covered right now. Medicaid is actually better than insurance because it has to provide what's medically necessary. And while they might have limits that are, um, you know, if you go above a certain number of whatever, like physical therapy benefits or units, you have to get a prior authorization. Unlike insurance, they can't have super hard and fast limits. Like some insurance companies might say, you get six, six visits a year with your primary care, period, no matter what you need. Medicaid might say, you get six visits of some whatever, something, and then you have to get a prior authorization, which providers don't like to do. But at least there's always, it's all based on medical necessity, which is really nice. The non-medical side of Medicaid or long-term services and supports are, is what you're going to have to do every day. It's services for, for which that are not supposed to be curing you, but are supposed to mitigate the effects of your disability. And that includes age-related disabilities. So now there's some services that might be felt as medical, but when you do them every day, they're not really. So for example, if someone doesn't have good movement, and they need range of motion. They need someone to move their bodies around for them. That, for someone who's like, had just had surgery and they're sick and they're getting like adjusted to either, a, a, they're either in, in rehab or recovering, that would be medical. You want a medical person to do it. But if you are at, you, you know, you haven't moved, you know, the left side of your body for 10 years and you need someone to move those limbs, that's no longer medical, that's maintenance. Um, other thing, but it also covers things that no one would consider to be medical, like um, transportation to go to the grocery store, um, adult daycare, um, a home modification, all of those kinds of things. And you can get these services one of two ways. One is in a nursing facility, which no one wants, and we discourage because no one wants to be in a nursing facility or through these waiver programs, and that's home and community-based services. Allison? Yeah, I just wanted to give an example of the kind of services that I get through this program as a chronically ill person, Great. Um, because it can feel a little intimidating at the beginning hearing about services that really don't apply to our population. So these are services that I get through the home and community-based services through Medicaid. Help with maintaining humidifiers and air filters in my house, help with doing my hair, help with bathing. Um, mobility assistance for me can look really different depending on the day. It could be getting my mobility scooter in and out of the car and plugging it in, maintaining it, or same with my manual wheelchair. Or on a lot of days lately for me, it looks like my husband walking next to me and holding my arm, um, and he's my mobility device. Um, it's also medication reminders. Um, cleaning, like vacuuming my floor, wiping down the bathroom, cleaning the kitchen after meal prepping, taking out the trash and the recycling, dusting for my allergies, making the bed, which is like um, a sport. If I was going to try to do it, I would, it would take me out for the whole day. Um, doing my laundry from start to finish, taking my dirty laundry down, washing it, folding it, putting it away. And then the biggest one for me is meal prep. And I say like from start to finish. So planning it, going to the grocery store, cooking it, um, washing the dishes, putting everything away, um, and then bringing the meals to me in bed if I need them. Um, and I apologize, my dog is going off about something. And so I want I want to say one more thing about that. So often. And sometimes you might get even attitudes about this from case managers, but I'll tell you what the rule is. 
So there might be things that a lot of us can do, but if we do it, that means we can't do anything else. So, um, or if we do it, it's totally ineffect ineffective. So like, I, I could mop a floor, but I'm just gonna roll my wheels and my wheelchair all over it. And it's gonna be twice as messy as before. Or I know people who deal with a lot of fatigue and they can prep a meal. Like, that, like they're not like no brain fog. Like they're not gonna leave the stove on. They can prep a meal, but if they do that, they're not gonna have the energy to take care of their children or to do their job, or like they can get dressed, but it's gonna take them, you know, an hour and a half. And then they're gonna have to rest for two hours. Even if that's what your situation is, you can still get these services because they judge you on, can you do it without like unreasonable hardship and in a reasonable amount of time? So it's really important. Again, you're gonna have case managers say, well, if you can do it, that, that's not what the rules say. So it's really important to understand that these are services that are available, even if you quote unquote can do it, but the way you would have, the, the sacrifice is not reasonable because quite frankly, for a lot of folks, it's a lot better for society, for all of us. Like for example, I'm gonna use Allison as an example. It's better for society and even for Medicaid for us to have her here and helping with this and reaching you know, all the people here and all the people that are gonna watch this you know, and other Medicaid committees she participates in where she does a lot of education about these things. Like she did this whole long COVID presentation for our committee and was awesome. it was really helpful. Um, that's better for society than if she were to spend all of her energy for the week doing her laundry, even if she quote unquote can do it. That is not a good use when someone else can do it without that kind of cost to themselves um, and then not be able to do anything else. So I just wanna make sure that we're really clear about this. Because, and, and again, I, I can't promise that you won't experience a case manager with an attitude or that doesn't get it, but that's where we come in as advocates. Um, but it's important that you all know and that you share with your peers that it does cover doing something that is just gonna take such a toll on you that it's not worth it. Um, I see there's a, a hand raised by an Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, um, I was just wondering because I do get long term support through the community and my um, case manager is, for lack of a better word, a ding dong. And um, she increased my hours at one point, um, f almost five months ago now. And I have not seen anything about it, and she's impossible to reach. Do you have a suggestion on that situation? And her boss is the worst person on the planet to deal with. She's just so ridiculously rude. Julie, if you're talking, we can't hear you. I can't see. Yeah, because I no, because I didn't unmute myself. I apologize. Um, so I, yes, it would be to complain to Medicaid because um, that's not acceptable. And um, if someone reminds me, there's actually a specific <laughs> that. Uh, let me get my dog. Out. I apologize. Um, that was the evil mailman. Um, uh, if someone reminds me, I will get the specific email address once I'm not sharing the screen with this to, to send because there, there is a specific case management com complaint form that they're asking people to use and uh, because they're trying to track this stuff. And, and it's very important that people file these complaints. And as we go through the presentation, you'll understand why. So Elizabeth, thank you so much for asking that. And, um, um, one more thing, sorry. Um, I've also been told that I am not allowed to request a new case manager. Like it's, they just won't that, do it. That is absolutely incorrect. So please put that in the complaint. And Mona, don't let me forget to get that. Um, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that, th thank you for raising that. Cause that is, that, and we have heard that. Are you, are you in Larimer County or a different county? Um, I am in Arapahoe. Oh, that's very disturbing and, and kind of surprising, but that is not true. Um, 
That was absolutely not true. You can't get a different case management agency, but you can get a different case manager. Um, so um, kind of already covered this. Um, you do have to go through an annual assessment. The other thing that's important is that you don't have to be housed to get these services. We've also heard people who are unhoused or, and unhoused could be sleeping on the street or in the shelter, but it could also be you're crashing at a friend of friends. And we've had people be told that they can't get services if they're unhoused and that's just not true. You can get, you, you, they're called home and community-based services and the community is for a reason. So you can get services anywhere. So like, for example, if you need help eating and you, again, back in the days when we used to do these things, want to eat at a restaurant or a friend's house, you can have your helper meet you there um, or go with you and help you. You can also have your helper be anyone you want, like a family member. And for some people, they feel better with a family member, a spouse, a parent, an adult child, um, now even a teenage child. You would feel better for them to be able to help you and other people really don't want their family members doing this and really feel better with outside people. It is, that is a very personal choice. Um, so Jose, did you wanna add something? Yes, by any chance, are you in uh, agency care or CDAS? I think she's, Elizabeth, I think he was asking you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm also working. What was the question? Are you in CIDAS or agency care? Um, both. So I have my mom working for me, but she works through an agency. Okay, we can help you get a better situation. We'll, we'll yeah. talk to you after. I see, I know exactly what the problem is now. Okay, I'm, and my- I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you the link for our help, advocacy help form. Okay. Uh, direct, directly in the chat and uh, please do fill it. Okay, thank okay, you. I appreciate it, thank you. Um, so um, there are a lot of different waivers and I think given this audience, I'm not gonna spend time on all of them. I'm not gonna spend time on the children's. There's two adult waivers I wanna talk about though. And if you're eligible for more than one, you can choose which one you wanna be in. So the two adult waivers I really wanna talk about is the, what they call EBD, which is elderly, blind, and disabled. Disabled means um, that you have a, a disability, a, a disability is defined by social security, but it doesn't have to be social security. And sometimes people say it does, it does not. And the state, you if you don't have social security, you go through a state process that is a lot easier than social security. I know tons of people that would never qualify under social security that get through the state process. Um, and um, obviously blind and then elderly is over 65. And then there's the community mental health services waiver. And I know that some people in early or, or sometimes not early, but in different phases of a journey with chronic illness and for, um, sadly it's this particularly women get psych diagnoses um, even when like they, they, and they, again, you get blown off by a number of doctors and, you know, dismissed for long enough, you probably do develop depression or anxiety. But if, if someone, if you can't get a physical diagnosis, there's no specific diagnosis that you need for elderly, blind and disabled. But um, if, if it might be easier for some people to get on the mental health waiver if you don't have a diagnosis um, or if that's gonna be a big fight because usually at that stage, you do have some mental health issues. So I just wanted to make sure people knew that was an option, but there's no specific type of diagnosis that you have to have. Whereas with other um, conditions, some of the other waivers like spinal cord injury, you do need a, like a specific ICD-9 code. And then with, the, with each waiver, there are certain services that you're eligible for. Um, so since, so anyway, there are services. And so our goal is to help understand what the process is. And then we're hoping that you'll educate others in your peer group. Now, these changes, the purpose for these changes is not to cut services. 
Um, and we are saying this really publicly and the state knows we're saying this because we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so as these changes are implemented, it's gonna be really important that we hear from people to make sure that they're not inappropriate cuts. So now we don't wanna say no one's ever gonna get cut because people might have a situation where they need, they genuinely need less. Um, I, I had a surgical procedure, you know, several years ago that did cut my knee and, and that those kind of cuts are okay, but usually clients will identify those. So they always say in Medicaid um, that the goal is to provide the right services at the right place and the right amount, at the right time and the right place. What is right is defined by us, is defined by us who are clients. So uh, now I, I'm going to talk about the in-person assessment, unless there are any questions. Uh, Julie, there's a question from Casey Shannon in the chat about supports provided for helping with kids at all. Oh, thank you. That was a, a very challenging issue for me when I had kids. Um, so technically, they don't. However, um, a couple things. One is if if your job is to cook dinner and it doesn't really take any more time to cook for one than it does for three or four, it's like you're cooking a meal, you're cooking a meal. But it just makes sure that the way you phrase it is always about what you need, not what your kid needs. Now, if your kid is disabled, that's a different discussion. I'm assuming this is for a disabled parent. And um, the other thing is if you get on the consumer directed program, you'll get hours assessed, but then you get to do your own hiring and management. So you don't, you don't have that fight of, well, this isn't for you, so we can't do it. I remember years ago when my kids were young, having, this was before we had consumer direction, having these aides say, well, we won't fold your children's clothes, we'll only fold yours. Um, and so if you, but if you get away from the agencies, then that is the way to manage that. Um, it's really, to be honest, I think super inappropriate and not client-centered and not family-centered, but the rules do say it is to help the client. And, and this is, again, kind of how society changes over time. The reason it's like that is because, um, is because this was kind of built on a model of elderly people. So they're saying, well, if, you know, if grandma is living with a family of six people, should we have the Medicaid paid homemaker clean for the whole house and cook for the whole family? Um, my answer to that, quite frankly, is it depends. If that's what's going to keep grandma in the community, that's still cheaper than $8,000 a month for a nursing home. Um, but the, the rule, and this goes into some federal rules, is no, that's, this is a community. Um, this is for the person. So I know that was kind of a circuitous answer and we'd be happy to talk online to help you strategize how to navigate that system. Um, Allison, you had your hand up and then Elizabeth has her hands up. Um, I'm gonna get, let Elizabeth go first. Okay. Um, so when I very first started um, with in-home support, I had an agency that without my mom, I had, I had a different person every day is what it felt like. Mm -hmm. um, and they went back to my case manager and said, well, she lives with her husband. And the case manager that I had, she was very adamant that it didn't matter that I lived with my husband, but her boss, the one that I said was unpleasant, and this is why, um, she said, well, because you have an in-home support, we're cutting your hours. So they cut my hours drastically, but my husband works full time and so do I. And I said, this just, it's just not going to work. So I had to fight for it, obviously. And I did eventually get it. Um, right. But is that something that they can do? Can they, can they just say, you live with your husband, you don't need that many hours, he can do it? Um, no, what, what they do is they, they talk about what's extraordinary, what someone so like, for example, if, if you and your husband eat together and he's going to cook anyway, and you don't have different diets, it, they're, they're not going to pay for that because he would be doing it anyway. 
But if you need someone in the middle of the day to help you with lunch and he works out of the home and you work somewhere else, then that would be, then lunch would be extraordinary. Okay. Um, that, okay. And that is a great example because that was one of the things that was actually pertained to me because he's vegan and I'm not, and I am on a very strict diet for medical gastroparesis. Lots right. Of stuff. And I, I told her, I told the manager over and over again, I said, he's not in, he's not home with me. I don't do any of the grocery shopping or cooking with him because we're very, very different. And she still was adamant that like, he lives with me. He should be helping me. And yeah. she cut my hours. I, when I say she cut my hours, she gave me less than the minimum required by Medicaid. Yeah. So it's the word that, yeah. And so, yeah, so that, that's a good example. So the, so, so that was wrong. Um, the word is extraordinary care is the word you need to use. Allison. Um, yeah, there was just a question in the chat. I think I was able to answer it, but the question, okay. was, um, my wife has COBRA coverage and I have coverage through the state exchange. She's in process of applying for SSI. Um, does she need Medicaid to get on these services? And yes, you do need Medicaid to get access to long-term services. And, and quite frankly, Medicaid's going to be much better than COBRA or the exchange. Um, so, I mean, don't drop it till you've got your Medicaid, but apply for home and community-based services because that's going to be faster than SSI. So, so it sounds like some of you are using these services already. And um, so some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. So these services, as Allison said, can totally change your life and health. And as Elizabeth mentioned, sometimes you've got to fight for them. But to get on them is, is a challenge. And you have to go through an assessment. And the assessment, there's an assessment now, and then there's going to be a new one. Um, but when any assessment is, so what is an assessment? Um, and we'll talk about why it matters, what are the benefits, and what's involved. So the assessment, so the first thing that scares people is they say, well, we have to do an assessment to see if you meet nursing home level of care. And most people, I mean, including me, you know, hear that term and just totally freak out um, and say, oh my God, I don't want to ever go to a nursing home, forget it. I don't, I don't want to do it. It's just a word. No one, there's a lot of people think, well, if they think I'm that bad, can't they put me in a nursing home? And the answer is there's no they and no, they can't. Um, the, it's a term that goes back, there's a whole legal history, but what you need to know for the purpose of today is it's just a word. You don't ever have to go into a facility if you don't want to. Um, it's, ju it's just a word that means you, you have to need help from a human, um, e even if the help then later comes electronically. But like You have to show that you need help to get through your day, and it doesn't have to be every day, but on more days than not. So if you need help once or twice a month, you're probably not going to qualify. But if you need help a few times a week, but not every single day, that's okay too. It's also okay if you need help multiple times every day. Um, it's just that you need help from another human. And the help doesn't have to be physical. It can be mental, cognitive. Um, it, so, it, but you need help to get through, to do what most people can do for themselves. So to get through to you know, keep yourself in your place. You know, sanitary doesn't have to be museum style. But to, you know, sanitary, clean. To make decisions, to communicate, to get where you need to go. Those are the things that they're looking at. Um, so, in in the purposes, and that's why they call it a waiver because the, you know there's a long history of of a institutional bias. So where it used to be that nursing homes were the only service and these were created as an alternative. Now, most people receive services through these community services, not nursing homes. Um, and so the assessment's really important and it's really hard. And so a case management agency completes the assessment and they're there to, in, in the assessment, it'll be a little bit more seamless with the new process but the goal is to decide if you're eligible and then also identify what services you need, what you need help with. So for example, if you need help with um, going to the store, let's say you need help with shopping. It might be that you really wanna do your own shopping, but you can't get there. And in that case, the appropriate service would be non-medical transportation. 
but it might be that you need help with shopping and you don't really want to do it yourself. That's too exhausting. In that case, it would be paying a caregiver to do it for you or with you, whatever, whatever you choose. So, but the questions can be really uncomfortable um, because they're very personal and it's sometimes, you know, it, and it's often a case manager that you don't know. So it's often someone who, you know, it's, it's very, they don't stay very long. So, you know, and again, some of them are wonderful people and some of them, you know, might be having a bad day or got into this for the wrong, re you know, some people go into this field because they genuinely want to be helpful. So there are people that get into it for the wrong reasons. They get into it because they want to have power over people or they're unhappy people and are taking that out, you know, or, or, or they don't have good social skills. So I'm not going to question other people's motives. I'm just going to say sometimes they're wonderful and sometimes they're not. And that's just a reality. Allison, did you want to add something? Yeah. So I just want to give people sort of a zoomed out lens. So if you are not on long-term services right now and you're wanting to apply, this assessment is part of the process of applying to know if you can qualify to get the services. So it's really yeah. important to understand um, what Julie's saying, that this assessment can be hard to go through as a patient because you have to be so honest about what your challenges are. It was really hard for me to go through, and I was really prepared and knowledgeable about this process because I had to be so honest. I've been so normalized to what my new normal is that I had to kind of remember what I was used to be able to do and then describe in detail how I was not able to do that anymore. Um, but this assessment process is part of qualifying to get access to long-term yeah. services. And, and um, I'll call on you a second, Elizabeth. I, I wanted to add to that to say, some of us have a hard time acknowledging even to ourselves our actual abilities. So if you're one of those people and you'll know, because people have probably told you, have someone there with you who can remind you of things. So for an example, if someone says, you know, can you get dressed okay? And you say yes, because you did that day, even though there were three days in the past week, you didn't go somewhere you wanted to go because you were too tired or, or you were in too much pain to do that. It, it might have, that's, you're going to go against yourself. You, you, you answer as if it's a bad day and you have to remember that it's not, can you, it's what is the cost? So it's really important that you have someone there to help remind you to, to just say, well, you know, Allison, you know, last week, you know, you, you told me three times that you didn't do something really important to you because you were too exhausted to get dressed. So like, while you can, um, maybe it's something you could use some help with. And that's, that's what it, you know, and if you don't have someone you're comfortable with, that's what we're trying to recruit advocates. We'll talk at the end about to do for you is to, um, is to be able to get to know someone who, who feels safe ask those questions, prepare you for those questions, because it is uncomfortable. Um, and a lot of people talk about feeling, you know, kind of judged when you're going through that, or just, you know, again, it's just uncomfortable. So, um, but the more honest you can be, the better it's going to, because eventually it's going to translate into not just, are you eligible, but how much you get. And again, we're not telling anyone to ask for stuff that is, that they don't need. But often what, what we see is people ask for less than they need and then they run into trouble. So um, Elizabeth and then Andrea. Um, I was actually just gonna say that it's helpful to just give them the worst case scenario mm -hmm. on like what your worst day is I found because I've done the assessment a couple of times over the years and you know, at first I was very like, don't tell them about X, Y, Z. And then it turned into, like you said, running like into issues where I didn't have what I needed. And then the exactly. next one I did it, it was like the absolute worst possible day I could have. And it, you know, it worked out a, a whole lot better. That was yeah. just, and, yeah. and if you get allocated more hours than you actually need, you don't have to use them. And that's totally fine. So like, it, it's not like you're wasting someone's money if you do that. So if you get allocated enough for six hours a day and, and it turns out that most days you can get by with four, that's okay. Use the four and then on the days you need the six, use the six. And if you have a really bad day, use the eight from the other ones you didn't use. Okay. Andrea? Oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I was just gonna say, I've been told by um, both my case manager and 
the agency, which my mom works through, that um, that they they have to stay here for the entire time. I can't send them home. That's that's not true. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Andrea, um, I was just wondering. You said that the process will be changing soon. Um, that there might be like um, a new process for the assessment. So if people are looking at getting into this, should they wait a little while to start the assessment process or should they get it started no. as soon as possible? No, just because again, if you need the services, I mean, it's gonna take time anyway. So don't wait. It, they're supposed to start the new process in April, but it's been postponed about six times already. So, so just do it whenever you're ready. Um, I just, you know, so, and, and there'll be some bumps when they're getting it going. I mean, it's, it's a big systems change, but don't, don't wait, but that's a good question. So again, you can choose who you want to be involved. Um, and, and again, that's very personal. Um, so just do what feels right to you. Um, so, um, They'll also ask you like what your goals are and don't feel like you have to have a certain kind of goal. Um, you know, your goal could be something very personal, like I want to feel better, or it could be, you know, I want to get a job, or it could be, I don't have a goal other than living my life. It's, they're just, they're required to ask you about that. Um, and they'll ask you about your, your routines and they should ask you if things need to be a certain way. So for example, um, you know, the person who, I think it was Elizabeth who mentioned that like having a very specific diet for someone who has that or has food allergies, it might be that food has to be prepared this very specific way. And that doing that takes more time because you've got to, like, you can't have, you're allergic to 27 things and you can't cross contaminate anything. So the whole kitchen has to be washed before your meal is prepared or whatever. So you have to, they'll ask those kinds of questions. Like if your routine, like if it doesn't make sense. Um, and they'll also ask about natural supports. And that gets to the question that came out earlier. Natural supports is code for, can we get someone to do it free? Um, and the answer is always no. Um, you know, natural, and again, nat, ideally natural supports are things that are reciprocal. Um, but that doesn't mean that your family should just do all this stuff for you for free because that's not a healthy dynamic. Um, if if they're feeling like they can't live their life because of your needs and they're, if, they're, if they're getting paid for it and that's a choice that you've all made, that's fine. But if, if you all feel helpless and feel like there's nothing else we can do, that doesn't help any of you. Um, so when they say natural supports because Medicaid doesn't, cover natural stuff that you can get elsewhere. It's the payer of last resort. So when they ask you about that, make sure you're very clear. So you can say, yeah, I have natural supports. I have some really good friends that I talk to, um, but no, none of them can do any of my care. Um, and just be clear that, and again, we don't want people to be isolated and without support, but there's supports that you should be paid for. And then we all support each other as friends. You know, we all have friends that we support. That's usually emotional support. That doesn't mean that you can never do, you know, accept help from someone else if it's, you know, I mean, I know often if there's a snowstorm, you know, neighbors might come by and say, hey, do you need me to run to the store for you? That, that's fine. But that doesn't become like a permanent job for someone. Uh, Jose and Andrea? Yes, there's a question uh, from Destiny in the, in the chat. And she's saying, can I request a new assessment if my needs change? How often can I do this? Absolutely. Absolutely, you can request a new assessment any anytime your needs change. Um, good, excellent question. Now, in the new assessment tool, you will be able to give... Um, uh, tell, like a, there'll be a thing online to be able to tell your personal story like a little portal. That's totally optional. Um, you can do it if you want someone to kind of know your story or what you've been through and you don't want to say it again. You can also use it as a place to say something like I always do. Of, I have lost dogs. So please don't send someone to my house who's afraid of dogs. My dogs are lovely, but they scare people because they're big and they're loud and they 
you know, sometimes jump. Um, so, or I have cats, if someone's severely allergic to cats, my house is not going to be a safe place. So you can just say that kind of stuff. Um, if you want, and again, it's going to be optional. So once they have the information and you're made eligible, they then create what they call a support plan, which is, which is basically your service plan. Um, so they, um, so that's important. And then they, uh, they follow, theoretically, they follow you throughout the year and they do a check in every quarter. It's been quite some time. And I think in rural areas, this isn't much of an issue as much as it is in the metro areas. It's been, I don't remember the last time I've had this same case manager for a whole year. Um, and again, I think in some of the rural areas, they actually have case managers that stay for 20 years, you know, but that's, so you may, when you say they follow you, it may or may not happen. Um, they're supposed to do the, the six month one face to face. Um, that's been lifted during the pandemic. Um, there's kind of talk right now about, and the quarterly one can be a phone call or an email. Um, there's kind of talk about what's gonna get restored and how right now none of the case management agencies are doing in-person assessments or visits even when the client's asking for it. Um, and there's you know, a whole lot to say about that. Um, again, that affects different people very differently. But they, they do this check-in and they will contact you if you're either overusing or underusing. They're supposed to if you're over or underusing services. So if they see no billing for you for a whole month, they're going to say what's going on um, because, if, because that's a problem. Or if you're using, you know, whether it's consumer directed care or non-medical transportation, if you're allocated a certain number of units and it's four months through the year and you've used half of them, they're going to say, you need to, you know, understand. And it might be, for some people, it might be, I understand perfectly. I have a really hard time in the cold, but I do great in the summer. That's true for a lot of folks with arthritis conditions. So they might say, in the summer, I can just take the bus, no problem. But in the winter, I can't get to a bus stop without, you know, being in horrible pain. So they are going to use their whole year in six months. Um, and then other people, it might be, oh, whoops, I better, you know, change this or figure something else out. So there's, and you'll get a copy of this presentation. Um, there's a whole glossary. There's a website that has all kinds of stuff about the waivers. Um, the links are in this presentation. Um, they should also go over your, um, you know, your rights and responsibilities as a client. Um, a few, you know, again, some of the rights is to get a copy of your plan. That's been a problem, quite frankly. Um, to choose where you live and receive services. You also have a right to get be provided with services that don't have a conflict of interest, meaning your case manager shouldn't work for the same company that is the agency that provides services. Um, you can change providers when you want. Now, right now, um, it, that's kind of a hollow promise because finding a provider is a challenge. So yes, you can change them, but you might not be able to find someone else. Um, and, but you also need to have the right to be provided with the support to make the process accessible. So, um, so something that we think might be an issue, particularly for your community, the new assessment is longer. So let's say you have a tolerance of an hour and after an hour, you're just not gonna be able to focus or you, you can't sit that long and you're not comfortable like getting up and down in front of someone. You can say, I, if this is gonna be more than an hour, I need to break this up and do it in two sessions. That's totally acceptable. Um, some people might say, I need to know the questions I'm gonna be asked ahead of time because I don't process quickly. Whatever you need to make it accessible, you can ask for. Now, if it's something that's totally unreasonable, they can say no. Like if you say, the only time I could possibly do an assessment is 1 a.m. on a Thursday morning, the first week of the month, Obviously, they don't have to do that. But if it's something like breaking it up, slowing down, um, being able, another thing is that they're supposed to do automatically with the new process, um, but they, can, they don't have the capacity to really do for everyone right now is make sure that you can look at what you said to make, because some people have brain disorders where they scramble things. Um, so to make sure that it might not be their misunderstanding, it might be that, oh, I mean, we get this all the time where someone says, 
yeah, what I meant to say is I really like to cook, but I have a hard time with it. But they forget to say I have a hard time with it. So they say, oh, I really like to cook. And then they get no hours for meal prep. Um, please, please so, low, yeah. lower the volume of your microphone, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, let me figure out how to do that. Hold on. While Julie's doing that, I just wanted to make a note that my original assessment was an hour and a half over the phone and I crashed really bad the day after because of the exertion of doing that and how cognitively demanding it was. So for my reassessment, I requested that the case manager communicate me with me via email instead of phone. And then she did like bullet points of all of her questions. And I was able to take time over several days to type out my answers. And then we just touched base on the phone for any clarifying pieces. And it was so much more accessible to me. So even if you don't identify as having a disability and that's not an identity that you have right now, you are still able to request accommodations to accommodate your chronic illness and what your symptoms are. And I encourage you to do that. Thank you. Um, so if you have a problem, is this volume better? Okay, um, thank you. There's two things, there's grievances and appeals. A grievance is about how they act and an appeal is about what you get. Grievances don't always result in a whole lot, but it's important to file them because the state collects how many grievances get filed and that gets looked at when people wanna get a new contract. If they're not just if they're filed, but if they're resolved, I actually think a company that has grievances should be looked at more favorably because that means they're telling people how to file them and not intimidating people or retaliating. Whereas if, because you can't run a program this big and never have a complaint, you just can't. So, um, but it, it helps if you have quality problems, if you don't get a timely response, like someone said, like I'm not, you know, they're not calling back. Those are things you file a grievance over and they should give you the grievance procedure, which they often don't. An appeal is a formal process that you use if your benefits or services are denied, terminated, reduced, or not acted upon. And that is where you actually file something and you go in front of an administrative law judge. Um, we, we help people with both of these, but grievances are much less formal. We also have responsibilities though as clients. And so some is, again, that accurate information, letting case managers know if, if you're moving, um, you're supposed to let them know if you've gone to a hospital emergency room or, or anything like that. Most people don't, you don't, that's not what you think about. Um, and so really it's like, you know, if you like break something and have to go to the emergency room to get a cast and you're out that day, I don't think it's that important. If, if you're in the hospital for three weeks and you're much weaker and you're gonna need extra care, then yeah. You can't use any of these HCDS services while you're in a hospital um, because that's because you, the, the way the funding is. Um, you also need to let your case manager know if you're not getting services that you're supposed to get through home and community-based services. Um, any questions before, we, Jose, did you wanna add something? Actually, your your computer keeps saying that it's too loud for the trans, for the transcript. I'm not sure what's happening. It it always says that. I'm just loud. Um, any that's that's just about the subtitles that are in my PowerPoint. And any other questions? Anything I'm missing? Um, there were just some questions in the chat, which I don't think we'll be able to see in the recording. So I just wanted to make sure to say okay. them out loud here. One of the questions was about the disability buy-in program, which gets you access to these long-term services. And the question is, is it limited by household income? Great question. And the answer is no, it's you're always a household of one. So thank you. So. Um, so I'm not gonna really go over the new and the old because it sounds like that isn't really relevant for this audience. Um, the, especially because a lot of the changes have to do with developmental disabilities. Um, but a couple little things is that they will be asking everyone in the new one about self-direction and employment. 
Um, and again, it's to promote the buy-in. It's not to say you have to work. And it's also to educate the case managers so that they stop thinking that if you can work, you're not eligible for this because you absolutely can work and be eligible for this. And that's been a kind of a cognitive dissonance thing that we've had to get past where people think, well, if you can work, then how are you that disabled that you need help? And in this day and age, there's all kinds of technology and support and accommodations we can get in the workplace um, that are helpful. So Lily, can you, um, what does self-direction mean in this context? Thank you. Um, self-direction in this context, we're Jose mentioned that he called it by the acronym, the CDOS program. So what that means is, and it's only for personal care and home health and homemaking right now, we're hoping to get it for other things. So instead of going through an agency, it, it's a program where you get training and then you, you can hire people yourself and you get the dollar amount and you can decide who gets paid and how much. So let's just say you're eligible for, just to make it simple, $100 a day of services. And that's, you know, I can't do math in my head, but you're eligible for that. You, you don't get the cash. It goes into a fiscal agent, uh, like someone, and they do payroll for you. So you get a little worksheet of, if you're going to pay, you know, $20 an hour, you've got to reserve $23, you know, to cover all the taxes and stuff. So if you're eligible for $100 a day, you can decide, do I want to pay three people $30 an hour? Or do I want to pay three, or do I want or for three hours, $30 an hour? Or do I want to pay for six hours at $15 an hour, which if you're in Denver, you can't do that because our minimum wage is higher. But, you know, you have to, and so, and you get training on like, what are the laws and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then you can decide what's valuable to you, who you want. And I think like Elizabeth was saying, like, then you don't have to deal with a different person every day. You do though, however, have to manage your own back so that you don't, if, if your aid is sick, you don't get someone else to call, like you have to handle that. So, but you're allowed to have as many people signed up with you as you want on your payroll. So a lot of people, it might look like they have, you know, 10 people working for them and they only use one or two, but those are people that they can call in a backup for backup if their aid is sick or unable to come for whatever reason. So what, what I always advise people to do, particularly, you know, in mountain communities is try and find at least one of your neighbor, if you don't live with someone, try and find at least one of your neighbors so that if it's snowy and it's really not safe to drive for several days, that you have a neighbor that can at least come do the essentials. It might not be everything. And then you're not asked, it's not like, oh, I'm asking for a favor, they can get paid. So Allison. Thanks, Julie. I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, the, the, so the program that I'm on is CDAS, which is consumer directed. And one mm -hmm. of the things that I liked about it the most is as a person whose chronic illness and disability started with a virus, I've been really scared of getting COVID and letting people into my house. And the best part about consumer direction for me was that I had control over who I hired and I got to make the rules about masks and if you've had an exposure and you do need to test negative. And I got to be in control of that because I was so scared about that before. Mm -hmm. um, so that is an option. And I also, one of the attendants that I pay for my care through CDAS is my husband. And then the other person I, I hired based on a, a job posting that I put out in my community. Yeah. And that's, and I'm sure you went through a discussion with your husband of, do, do does this work for us? Um, in some marriages, it doesn't, and some it doesn't, and that's okay. And it can even change over time and it can, and that's okay. Um, but that you're right. It gives you the control. And, um, and I think, for yeah, I mean, I had similar things with COVID and, and very strong feelings about who comes, you know, because I was terrified about, especially after hearing your presentation, terrified about long COVID. So, um, but wanting to, wanting to try and control like who's in and out of my home and, you know, and to be able to do stuff like say like, yeah, you, you must be vaccinated. Other people I know did not feel that strongly and didn't have that requirement, but we all get to decide to set those rules. We also get to decide what's important to us, um, what, like what, you, what we pay more for versus what we pay less for. Um, is it super important that someone comes at a super early hour or is something else more important? And, and again, that's just gonna differ with all of us based on our lives. So um, I'm going to move on to the case management um, system because um, I just want to do a 
yeah, because we, I just want to do a little time check here. So, um, oh, Elizabeth, do you have a question before I moved on? Um, yeah, I did. Um, okay. My mom has her own chronic illness problems. And so mm -hmm. some days she can't come and she also lives an hour away. And I was wondering if it was possible to have like two different caregivers. So like for more intimate things like showering, I, I prefer my mom. Um, Absolutely. But yeah. I want somebody else that can be here more regularly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, it's in CDAS, we actually encourage people to never just have one. I think the rule actually says you have to have more than one. Um, so we definitely, you can and, and you should. Um, and, and again, I think we can talk to you later about switching because I think consumer direction might make more sense for you, but we can talk to you offline about that. Jose? Yeah, we have two questions in uh, the chat. Oh, okay. One of them is, who can I contact to learn more about disability buying? Um, you can, um, you could, Jose, can you, can you get the buy-in page from HICPUF site and also our, um, you can contact our staff to learn more about this too? Can Absolutely. you put that in the chat? Thanks. Uh, absolutely. And the other question is, my dad has Parkinson's disease and is 67, not working, retired. Will he qualify for the buy-in program or does he need to be working at least one, uh, some? Um, he would not, if he's not working at all, he would not, but he might still qualify for regular home and community-based services. His income can be about 2,300 a month. Um, and there is an asset test for the regular program, but your home is excluded. And if he's married, um, there's a lot of exemptions there. So, but if, but if, if he has like, you know, a savings account or other like stocks or other assets, then he would have to be on the buy-in. Um, right now, the buy-in is not available to people over 65, but that changes July 1st. So, um, so right now with case management, there's different companies based on what your disability is. And so everyone here would go to what they call a single entry point. And in lots of parts of the state, that's a county. Um, um, the, and then people with developmental disabilities go to a different kind of company. And that's going to change where there's going to just be a case management agency. And, um, and and hopefully they'll be able to manage it better at the state because instead of having two systems, like with 40 different agencies, there'll be more like 25 um, agencies. And the other advantage of this is that they will... Um, do an assessment and then tell people all the different waivers they might be eligible for. Whereas right now you have to kind of know and how are you going to know if you're not in the system? Like, it's not like, it's like all of this stuff, like these different waivers and these programs is not stuff the average person just knows. So, um, and then there's also some quality things that, you know, they're, they're, it's going to all be competitively bid. So there, there'll be some quality measures because right now, again, a lot of, a lot of times it's just, well, the county's always done it, so they do it, and there's really not a lot of oversight. So the hope is that it'll be um, better, that there'll be better quality, better oversight. Um, but, but to be honest, to make that real, that's going to require our, as a community, being vigilant and involved. Um, so and in, the, in the developmental disability system, there is a lot of conflict, um, conflicted case management, and by that I mean the same company that employs the case managers also employs service providers. And that's just, that just gets really messy to manage. So the, the last part um, is something that is going to um, happen not until 2024, but it's really important. And, and there's gonna be the development of, of an algorithm. Um, and it, that's a computer program that will input what you tell them in the assessment and spit out a, a kind of a, a dollar amount, or it might even be a range of dollar amounts of what, how much services you're gonna get. And, and, and again, then that gets kind of allocated of, you know, some, some goes into transportation, some goes into personal care, whatever. But um, that's why it's so important now that people start understanding how, impo how important it is to 
be totally honest in these assessments because as that gets developed, you know, the, everyone uses a baseline. So it, it so that's just very important. Now the re, now there's good and bad with this. Um, the the bad is is anytime there's a system, things don't work. You know, there's always going to be a problem. There is going to be an exception process, and um, so. Um, but the other thing that I like about this is right now there's so much subjectivity and judgment. Um, on the part of case managers. So like you have great case managers that are really going to work and like try and get you what you need. And, and again, they're using the rules, but you can have others that really have a lot of bias and, um, and, and don't understand. And maybe it's, they're from a, maybe it's like you're from a different culture than them, or they just have an attitude about benefits or whatever. And, you know, so we have like whole communities where this is seen as like someone's personal pocketbook and people just are not getting what they should get. Um, I mean, like we've had people, someone said, well, my husband should do it. We had someone and they thought that her 14 year old son should be like showering her um, and helping her like use the bathroom and, and had told this woman, um, like from the time, you know, that if she admitted she needed help with this, that they would send child services. Um, obviously we found out about that and resolved that, but like this, you know, that that's like totally inappropriate. Um, no one should have to live like that. And this is going to stop a lot of those biases because everyone asks the same question and the answer goes into this thing. And it's, but again, it's gonna be up to us to make sure it works. And that's gonna require a lot of vigilance, a lot of reporting stuff to advocacy organizations if there's a problem. Um, in other states, we've, we've been involved in this for a while. In other states, there have been three elements that have made this a disaster. One is managed care. Some corporation is running their long-term care system. In Colorado, we don't have that. And we actually have a law that says we cannot have it for long-term care. The other thing is there's no transparency. Like no one knows what happens with the info, like how it, you know, how when you feed in these things, it comes out to such and such a number. Well, we we have promises that there will be transparency and those promises are in writing and have been very public. Um, we've done other presentations like this where we've talked about it where the state has been on the line. Um, and then third is no exception process. And we have, again, commitments that there will be an exception process. And obviously, if we keep having to make the same exception on the same thing, then we need to tweak the algorithm, which is part of why it's taking so long because we decided we're gonna build our own instead of buying an off the shelf one. Because when you buy an off the shelf one, you can't tweak it. You have to get permission and there's all of this stuff. So, we feel like we have set the guardrails that we can, um, but it, this is going to happen in every state. And again, there's states doing it themselves or there's managed care. And I think this is a better way um, to do it because the program's just getting too big to just have everything be, you know, not standardized um, as much as we don't like everything to be individual. And then of course, the other reason to have some standardization is just the equity concern. So um, are there questions before we kind of get to this? Allison, go ahead. We Call do have question. a question and I'm answering in, in the chat uh, okay. because we can help her with this. She was asking uh, if someone is not, isn't in Medicaid at, at all yet and they want to go on to Medicaid and also apply for LTSs, where do they start? Okay, um, they would start with the local single entry point. Um, and yeah, we can, and, and, and again, you have to also like apply for Medicaid. So there's, there's kind of three steps. You have to do it. If you're not on social security, do a disability determination, which again, we can send you that information. You would have to um, apply for Medicaid and again, figure out if you're, and you can do that online um, or we can help you. It, and then third is you would do the assessment with your single entry point agency. And the, the HICPUP website has all of the single entry points, but we can also help you and send you that list. To, or just if, you just, if we just know where you live, we can just send you that one. So Allison? So Julie, Hello. I just want to clarify oh. on this um, single entry point. So I'm in Larimer County. So my single entry point is the Office for Long-Term Care Medicaid at Department of Human 
services. And that's who I called to leave a voicemail to say mm-hmm. I wanted to apply for long-term care. I had already been on the disability buy-in Medicaid program for several years. So my application was a little bit shorter than if you're not on Medicaid yet. Absolutely. Um, I did want um, to ask- Alison, just one thing before you continue. We have another question and I want to answer. Nicole, we are going to have the recording of this event in YouTube. It's going to take a few hours, but it's going to be in our channel in YouTube. You can find it by the name of the presentation. Thanks, Jose. Um, uh, oh, so can CCDC help people from the beginning of the process of applying for Medicaid, or do you only help troubleshoot when there are barriers? We can. Um, we don't have the capacity to do it for everyone. So like we, we try and help people that like really can't do it themselves. And again, that's another reason we're doing these is that this, this is kind of a lay of the land. But then the next time we're going to go around and do these, we're going to train people to do that. Um, so we're looking for volunteers to help because we think as we advertise this program more, there's going to be more need for help. And we're thinking if we could train people in different communities to just help a few people it, it, and then let us know when there's trouble, that would be a better use of everyone's time. Because if we just kind of like keep that knowledge ourselves and put and just have everyone call us, there'll be backups. And then... Um, that isn't that isn't good, and we want this to be, you know, more accessible, more open. So, but we can if someone doesn't, if someone needs that help, we'll generally, you know, our staff will generally ask someone, you know, to say, well, here, here's a few things. Can you do this yourself, or do you need us to do it? What you know, and then depending on what someone needs, will depend on how much we can, you know, help. But there's also there's another question in the chat by okay. Madison. Madison is asking if you already have on Medicaid, uh, do you need to go through the waiver process to get an assessment or can you have an assessment without the waiver? No, the, the assessment is what gets you on the waiver. So if you have regular Medicaid, like you buy it or just not, you know, just regular Medicaid because you're low income, you do, and that's, and you do need to um, qualify. The assessment is what they call the level of care. Um, and, and so, yeah, you do need to go through that assessment if you, if you want these services. Now, if you just need regular Medicaid, so some people might just say, you know, what I really need is physical therapy and medication, and I don't need anything else. Then you don't need this program. You, you would need, um, if, if that's really genuinely all you need and you're not just like not doing stuff because you're, because of your health issues. So if you just need Medicaid, then you don't need long-term care. Um, Resnia? Hi, um, this is a little bit of a side note, but I know there are some people on this chat that we've talked about it. Um, Medicaid will cover wheelchairs, but often they, yes. won't, they won't cover how to get the wheelchair in and out of your car. Um, Correct. Because they say it's not durable medical equipment. And I just found out recently that you can apply through this waiver program, you can apply for a lift to get it in and out of your car. And they, they class it under home modification. And so I just really? wanted to throw that out there in case that's helpful. <laughs> Look at Allison. <laughs> We've talked I, about this. So, um, yeah, so I that's knew just that something was, I wanted to throw out there. I knew there. that they did that for the developmental disability waiver. I'm not aware that they did it for other waivers. Yeah, so they told me to apply for it because I fall, I have my disability status with the state of Colorado has been verified. So they told me to apply under the EBD um, for that waiver. Um, and I'm, I'm just about to start the process, so okay. there might be hiccups, but I just wanted to kind of let some people know yeah. because I know that's an issue. That, that's, I'd love it. I'd love to know if they actually do it. That's interesting. I, I can let you know. I can shoot Great way to go about it with Home Mod. Um, I've never heard of that happening, but that doesn't mean that it can't. Um, I was actually doing the same thing because I'm about to get a power wheelchair and I was like, well, I can't get it in, it's 200 pounds, I can't get it in my car. Um, And they said that it's considered a home modification. So I I was told the same Hmm. thing. Okay, wow. I'm going to follow up on that, that's fantastic. Um, So 
And I know there was some additional home modification money through the American Rescue Act funds. Um, so, um, and I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that's, what, what, what that is. So we've talked about how we really need help um, and we really need involvement and engagement. And again, this can be as much or as little as you wanna do. So don't feel like if you have, you know, if you can't, you know, commit to like a 40 hour week that you can't be involved because a lot of this might be a couple hours a month, um, but it's more, so we really need to go wide on this. Um, so Mona is gonna give you some information on how you can be involved. Um, yes, so some of the ways you can get involved is, number one, you can be in a, take on an advisory role on, um, in a single entry point or a case management agency or a community-centered board. Another option is to work on the person-centered budget algorithm. Uh, this uh, state hasn't started working on that uh, yet. So there will be announcements as to when that is going to begin. And then uh, we also are formulating, um, or as Julie mentioned, we're building an army of advocates uh, to help people with their long-term services and supports or advocate for them on behalf of CCDC. So to help people in your community get the services they need. Um, and uh, this, and you will learn the new assessment tool in detail as well. Um, and then uh, we also have a steering committee for this project. That's how important this project is to us and how big it is. And so off of that, we have three subcommittees uh, that you're welcome to join and contact me if you'd like to be part of those committees. First one is the new assessment tool. Uh, the other one is the case management redesign and number three, outreach. And and then lastly, there's a John Barry's um, list, um, constant contact where you'll get, receive uh, dates from HIPPUF on uh, different um, legislation. There's also, he also posts links to meetings. Um, for instance, they just had a meeting yesterday. I think it was on transitioning from adult to, or from child to adult. And he'll post the links and how you can join uh, the times and the dates. Uh, so there's a lot of information there. So um, we have the link in the uh, presentation for that, uh, for uh, for John Barry, and it's John dot R dot Barry B A R R Y at C O dot U S or did I state state dot C O dot U S state dot C O dot U S yes. Um, so that's another great resource. We will share the the PowerPoint with you. Um, and because there's a bunch of frequently asked questions in here also that we just don't want to like read to people. Um, are there any other questions that people have or concerns? And I'm going to try and find that case management complaint. Um, Julie, um, how do we want to share those, that presentation? Because we don't have an official list of people who are here. No, I'm going to send it to Allison and then she will post everything. 